Excellent. So we are <clears throat> rounding out the hour or hours um, with a talk by Jason Williams on a topic that for those of us in the northwestern part of the country uh, have seen a lot of this year. Uh, Jason's going to talk to us about snow and uh, western juniper, I believe. And Jason comes to us from the Northwest Watershed Research Center, USDA Ag Research Service in Boise. Jason? Everybody hear me okay? And no? I'll try to hold it. Am I better? Okay. All right. Things are off to a good start. Um, okay. So, uh, and, and just one point of clarification, I guess I've, I've I'm now at the Southwest Watershed Research Center in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, it's been a change since uh, we rolled this paper out uh, that was led by Patrick Cormos. Um, but what I'll be talking about today is, is not necessarily birds, but, but vegetation and how vegetation influences water. And then, of course, that, that can have implications for, for sage grouse. Um, this is collaborative work between the ARS location in Boise, Idaho, and the location in Burns, Oregon. Uh, the work involves sort of selection of watersheds and instrumentation of those and collection of data and then some uh, modeling uh, once we have that data in hand. So there's a lot of work across a number of individuals that you see here. Uh, this work was led by Patrick Cormos in our, our Boise office. So I'll just kind of start with the overarching goal, which is to better understand how juniper encroachment affects water availability for eco-hydrologic processes and the vegetation attributes on uh, snow-dominated rangeland, snow being a key, key element of the talk today. Uh, and then just by way of an outline here, we'll, we'll go over uh, research questions. I'll talk a little bit about the watersheds themselves, uh, the approach that we use here, which is using um, uh, field-collected data in concert with modeling effort. Uh, then we'll go over the, some of the results and, and implications. Uh, this is kind of an iconic figure here from the Reynolds Creek Experimental Watershed showing uh, the drifting of snow, and that's sort of an important piece of what, what I'll talk about today. Okay, so these are the study sites. Uh, we have four watersheds uh, in southwestern Idaho right along the Oregon border. Uh, each of these watersheds are about 50 hectares in size. Uh, some are larger, some are a little smaller. Uh, these sites are currently uh, dominated by juniper vegetation, about 40 to 60 percent juniper cover on average. Uh, there are weirs at the outlet for each of the watersheds monitoring stream flow. Uh, we have six weather stations uh, that you can see there. Uh, there are some symbols indicating the locations of, of those. Uh, those are collecting a suite of meteorological variables uh, hourly. Um, Let's see, slopes are about 20%. Precipitation is, uh, exceeds 600 millimeters, with most of that being as snow. And about 20% of that water then leaves the, the catchments as stream flow. Uh, we have extensive uh, field collected data here, as well as um, some instrumentation and LIDAR data sets available for topography and vegetation. So our approach here to sort of characterize uh, how, the, how snow is distributed on these sites and how that affects water is to develop a distributed model of snow accumulation and melt uh, for juniper dom dominated conditions and for sagebrush dominated conditions. And then water availability is assessed um, through using time series modeling, so using that distributed data in a time series format uh, to predict water delivery uh, to the soil surface. So the model I'll talk about in a moment, it doesn't predict infiltration, but it predicts water available for infiltration and stream flow and evapotranspiration. Uh, and then we use that time series to derive an annual water budget, uh, primarily the components of stream flow, evapotranspiration, and of course precip, which we're measuring and modeling. Uh, the model, which I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on, uh, mainly because Patrick Cormos or Danny Marks would be better at explaining that to you. Uh, but this is a physically based model, the ice snowbound model uh, that we commonly refer to as the ARS snow model. 
uh, uses catchment topography and distributed meteorological forcings uh, to estimate snow water equivalent, snow melt, and I have soil water input here. It's really water available for soil water, uh, for soil input or infiltration. Uh, the resolution for the model is a, at a 10 meter spatial grid with uh, one hour time steps. And then it accounts for the influence of vegetation um, in terms of the radiation, its effect on wind speeds and the redistribution of snow. So in the paper, we uh, provide, in the paper we provide uh, a lot of detail on basically on how well the model performed relative to some measured data. Again, these, these watersheds are currently uh, dominated by uh, juniper vegetation, so we uh, have a bunch of field measured data uh, that we can actually use to, to sort of evaluate how the model performed for the juniper condition, and then we're using those data and what we know from some adjacent sagebrush communities to build a model for the same watersheds without the trees so in a, a sagebrush condition. And so what you see here are some uh, model results for snow water equivalent, the green lines, compared for uh, each of the six um, climate stations we have there, compared with some measured uh, snow water equivalent uh, data from snow courses and snow surveys, which are the individual symbols there. Um, so again, each graph there is an individual weather station, and we have six water years of data there. And overall, what you can see is that the model performed uh, reasonably well relative to the measured data. There are a few places where it's under and over predicting, but overall we're very satisfied with the model's performance. Uh, again, you can look at the paper for details on that. So now we'll start looking at um, some of the data. So here we're, we're looking at data for uh, snow water equivalent predicted by the model for both the juniper and the sagebrush condition. And again, here we're looking at differences in the uh, the amount of snow water equivalent associated with the snow distribution. Uh, for each of six water years, this is aggregated across all four watersheds. And the key things to point out here are the fact that uh, for the juniper condition, we actually see uh, higher snow accumulation, but that snow melts off a little bit sooner. So the green line is for juniper and the blue line is for the sagebrush dominated uh, condition. So sagebrush, we're getting perhaps less snow accumulation, but that snow is staying on the landscape longer. So perhaps even more important than how much snow we have is how it's distributed. And so one of the key, uh, I think, elements of what we see from the modeling effort here is that for the uh, juniper dominated scenario, snow cover tends to be more uniform. That's the, um, the upper part of the graphic, the four watersheds shown there across the top. Um, you can see the map is colored with snow water equivalent values more evenly than the graphic at than the bottom of the graph uh, that shows the sagebrush dominated scenario. So with the trees, wind speeds tend to be uh, reduced and snow tends to form more uniform cover throughout the watersheds, whereas under the sagebrush condition with higher wind speeds, uh, topography and vegetation interact to form these large snow drifts that tend to persist on the landscape for a longer period of time. Um, than the uniform cover under the juniper condition. So what does that, that, uh, those differences in snow distribution mean for water delivery? Uh, I could have alluded to that already. This is a graphic of uh, surface water input or water available for that. And what you see is that, uh, as I alluded to in the previous graphs, there's more water available under the juniper condition, but the availability of that water is slightly delayed uh, for the sagebrush scenario that we modeled here. So we'll now take a, a quick look at the water balance. So this is a water balance derived from modeling uh, of both, both sets of conditions. Uh, the, the bars in uh, part A there, the top of the graph, are for the juniper condition. And in part B, it's for the sagebrush condition. Again, this is a, a mixed sagebrush system that we've modeled. So there's some mountain big sagebrush and some low sagebrush in here. Uh, but what we really see between the, uh, the two different scenarios we modeled is greater water available from uh, the, juniper, uh, the juniper vegetation uh, and then the condition with sagebrush. Uh, less water, but there's a greater allocation of water to evapotranspiration uh, for the tree environment. For the sagebrush system, uh, there's a greater allocation of water to stream flow in terms of its uh, relationship or, or relative to the juniper model. So we'll take a little closer look at evapotranspiration here. Um, 
So the green bars here represent the juniper, uh, the juniper model, and the gray bars represent the sagebrush model. And you can see that uh, if we sort of run an average through there, it's about 300 millimeters of ET based on our, our modeling um, design here for the sagebrush, and then somewhere on the order of 400 to 500 millimeters for the juniper condition. So you can see much greater evapotranspiration under a juniper uh, landscape. So here we can take a closer look at runoff. Again, with the green bars representing the juniper scenario we modeled and the gray bars representing sagebrush. And this just further illustrates the point that uh, for the sagebrush condition, uh, we're seeing a much higher allocation of water towards stream flow uh, than for when the site is dominated by trees. This is across the, uh, the six different water years there. Okay, so short and sweet. Um, really now just looking at, at the implications of this. Again, uh, no pictures of birds and nothing to talk about specifically to birds here. Uh, but what we know about these sagebrush systems is they're very dependent on the pulses of water from snow melt. Uh, soil moisture patterns for sagebrush communities at this elevation uh, where, where the precip is snow dominated. Soil moisture throughout the year is strongly dependent on the spatial distribution of snow as we might expect. Um, but you know, some studies tracking soil moisture conditions over the course of the year found that uh, for, for almost every, every seasonal aspect of soil moisture, uh, really you can link it back to where the snow was distributed and how much snow was accumulated. So snow is an important driver of soil water, pro or soil water available for uh, a host of processes here, including stream flow initiation uh, and the amount of water through snow input also affects the timing of stream flow cessation. So uh, what we're seeing for these elevations uh, is a, you know, some persistence of snow through the forms of drift uh, tends to prolong water availability for stream flow later in the summer season, uh, which could be important as uh, lower elevations tend to be losing snow or, or they have less snow now than they used to historically. Um, and then, of course, at lower elevations, sage grouse are filling the pinch from cheat grass and fires. So it may be important to uh, retain these higher elevation sites where we can still get uh, persistent snow forming in the drifts and have some prolonged summer stream flow that may have some downslope contributions to forming wet meadows and uh, wetting up riparian zones, providing uh, habitat, or at least in, in terms of providing food for habitat. So this work is highlighted in um, the Science to Solution article shown here from the Sage Grouse Initiative. I think there are copies on the table outside the door, uh, as well as uh, here's a snapshot of the paper here that's available in Rangeland Ecology and Management uh, that's open access. And that concludes the, the talk, and I think we have plenty of time for questions probably. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, I think, so with the, I'd probably have to have Patrick in here to explain it specifically, you know, from because he modeled precip based on what we measured at the weather stations. Uh, but as the wind speeds are, are lower, the snow tends to drop out and accumulate and deposit there. There's probably some loss of snow with the wind blowing it out of the watersheds, perhaps, um, with the, the sagebrush, but we do see the drifts form under the sagebrush condition. So that probably has something to do with it. And then, uh, the more the earlier melt out from the from the juniper sites has to do with radiation from the trees um, and also thinner snowpack there too so. at this elevation it's mountain big sagebrush there there's some low sagebrush on the site too on some of the aspects there Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how are we accounting for the lack of snow under under the trees? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. And, and I don't, I, you know, Patrick Cormos would probably be best to address how he dealt with that in the modeling context. Um, again, the the precip that we're distributing here, we're measuring at a weather station, and we're using the model to distribute that. And it's a physically based model, so it's going to account for radiation effects of the trees and how that affects melt. Um, so I, I don't know exactly how to specifically address. 
uh, your question other than to, to sort of tell you that's how the model is organized and developed for distributing snow on the site. But yeah, in the real world scenario, we know that there are pockets under the trees that may be uh, a little more hollow than, you know, sort of out in the open between the trees. Yeah, our experience in, on these landscapes, we, we talked a lot about that in developing the model, how to deal with interception of snow. So the question was, or, or the comment, I guess, was the fact that the trees can intercept a lot of snow. And, and in this case, you know, we're assuming that most of that snow that's intercepted, and this is based on our experience of being out on these sites, uh, these are not extremely cold environments. That snow tends to melt and plop through the canopy and drip down to the ground. And so we're assuming that uh, the interception component and losses through interception are, are negligible in this environment that we have here. It's not the case in some colder environments where the, tree, where the trees will hold that snowpack for a longer time period, uh, at least in the sites at the elevations that we're talking about here in our experience uh, that you know, most of that snow melts and just plops through the, through the canopy. So, you know, in the paper we talk about that assumption and how that might affect the results and, and a number of other assumptions. Anytime you have a modeling uh, exercise like this, there are a number of assumptions that you, you have to make and, and we cover those in detail in the paper. Maybe we should have coffee and talk about this in detail. Yeah, so and again, that's a, a modeled stream flow. Um, but basically, the water available for that and the stream flow generation would be perhaps later in the uh, sagebrush dominated environment, but there would be a prolonged delivery of that water later in the summer relative to uh, the juniper dominated site. Does that answer your question? The question was uh, how might the, um, the differences in the two vegetation types affect the timing of the, the water delivery through stream flow? Yeah. Thank you. Well, that uh, concludes uh, our session on uh, the special issue of REM that focuses on uh, woodland encroachment into the sagebrush steppe and southern Great Plains. Uh, I'd like to get another round of applause for all the speakers today, if we could. So this was recorded live and all of these presentations will be available for download or at least viewing on the uh, Sage Grouse Initiative website here in about a three week time frame. Uh, thanks again for your attendance and attention today. Um, have a great rest of your conference. Thank you.